I am Stephen Gashler, and my family, the Gashler family, is going to be performing for this final hour. We are so glad to be here. We are a family of compulsive liars, also known as storytellers. We are also playwrights and musicians and YouTubers and all sorts of fun stuff, but really we just like to tell lies. There's just something exhilarating about filling people's heads with all manner of nonsense and being praised for it. It's really kind of addicting. You should try it sometime. So, we have a bunch of stories for you today. Many of these were award-winning storytellers. Between us all, we've taken home a bunch of audience choice and first place awards from the Utah's Biggest Liar, the Timpanogos Hauntings Contest, the National Storytelling Network, and we're gonna share some of those tall tales with you today. So, our first performer is Sir Percival Gashler. Come right up, Percival. Sir Percival is actually one of the original knights of the round table. About a thousand years ago, he was on a dangerous and glorious quest up to northern lands when unfortunately he had a nasty running with an iceberg. About a thousand years later, we were looking for a block of ice at Walmart when we found him in the frozen section and chipped him out and immediately fell in love with him. As the greatest knight who ever lived, Sir Percival tells glorious tales of adventure filled with lots of violence. Take it away, Sir Percy. Okay. One day my dad came with work. Now the world got to see him, so I ran out of my hiding place and punched him in the gut. In response, he picked me up, threw me on the couch. I didn't mind, I just picked up a pillow. Threw it at his face, so he picked up two pillows and threw them at my face. First, I dodged the pillows. Then, I saw that her legs gave him a good hard squeeze. This made my dad flip and fall. I had to go until I jumped on him and punched him ten times. First he pushed me up. Then he clobbered me with pills and did a body slam on me. It hurt, but I was super strong. I could take it. Next, I threw an entire cousin at my dad. This made him angry, so he picked up two cousins. Threw them at my face. I dodged him just in time, but he was only getting started. Next, he threw the entire couch. It was a good thing I was so fast and strong. So I picked up the other couch and threw it at him. This made him even angrier. When he threw a refrigerator at me, I protected myself behind a wall of broken couches. They had to fight back. So I pulled the books up so, and threw them one by one. Then I threw the cell. Then, the, then I threw the dining room chairs. Then I threw the dining room table. By this point, the house was falling apart. And we had to run away from home to bleed. But we didn't care if nothing mattered but the fight. Next, my dad did three fifths in the air and tried to karate taught me. I dodged him with a double back handspring. Next he pulled out a bazooka and tried to blast me, but I just fell for a force field. I ran at him lightning fast and stuffed ten bombs down his pants. This made him so mad that he picked up the car and threw it at me, so I picked up the house and threw it at him. Next my dad did a hundred deaths at me that saw heat seeking missiles. Luckily, I, roll, I had all the money in the world and all the power, plus 10 extra lives, so I was invincible. All I had to do was snap my fingers and a thousand ninjas appeared, fighting wolves. Well, 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 just laser guns with teeth, and the ninjas had swords and guns. That sword that explodes when they hit you, that's more powerful than when, than when really an atom by the time the power of the sun plus infinity. I totally beat my dad in the fight. That's why I became the champion of the universe. All right, thank you, Sir Percival. I don't know how you translated, you know, robot wolves with laser guns for teeth, but good job to our interpreter. Um, next up, we have my daughter, Aspen. Now, Aspen, we discovered while going through Aspen Grove, and we noticed on the stumps of one of the Aspen trees was a little green baby. We soon picked her up and adopted her, and appropriately named her Winifred. However, then we decided to call her Aspen, just as a nickname. Aspen, uh, we believe, is actually a forest elf, which would explain her magical abilities, including a superhuman tendency in gymnastics, and as well as a larger-than-life propensity for telling great big lies. Come on up here, Aspen. Aspen's going to share two of her stories today with you. Uh, one of them was her 2019 winner from the Utah's Biggest Liar Contest. It was almost my little brother's birthday, and he only wanted one thing, to ride in a fire truck. 
My mom called the fire department and asked if this could be arranged, but they said they were too busy for the next six months. So I suggested the family abandon all responsibilities, jump on a red-eye flight to Southern California, crash at a Hilton Hotel, and spend a few thousand dollars at Disneyland. My brother and I agreed this would be a suitable substitution for a fire truck, but even then, my mom and dad said no. I couldn't bear to see my brother brokenhearted. So, I took matters into my own hands. If we couldn't go to Disneyland, I would bring Disneyland here, to my backyard. So, a couple days before his birthday, I started off with the most important attraction of any theme park, the haunted house. So, I tied strings from the house to the fence, and then I hung garbage, ca- garbage bags from the strings, and voila, a dark and creepy labyrinth. I didn't have any animatronics, so I had to settle for my sister, Raya. Her job was to wear a ghost mask and chase the guests, shouting terrifying words such as boogity and rawr. I didn't have any guinea pigs to test on, so I had to settle for cats. Elliot, on one hand, seemed to find the haunted house entertaining. He even purred when the ghost pet him. Misty, on the other hand, totally freaked out, tore half of it all down with her claws. It was a good thing we were doing these tests because it helped us define our policies. Rule number one, no cats. So after I repaired the haunted house, I started off with the another attraction that needs to be in any theme park. The roller coaster. Technically, it was a wheelbarrow. The track was made from leaning plywood against the sled. But then I realized the ugly truth. Pushing the wheelbarrow up the track was beyond human propulsion. So I I built a giant slingshot out of 435 rubber bands. Building it was the easy part. The hard part was finding someone willing to test it. Neither my sister nor the cats were willing, and I certainly wasn't going to do it. Eventually, the neighbor boy, Walter, settled on it, but only for the high price of 10 otter pops. The good news is, when we let it go, it flew to the top. The bad news is, it kept on flying. Luckily, the crash landed in Walter's backyard, so his mom could take him straight to the ER. Rule number two, each guest must sign a waiver and have catastrophic health insurance. For the third and crowning attraction, nothing would do but a classic merry-go-round. So, we brought out the washing machine on a dolly, And we also got a round card table. And we put it together, so when you turn it on, it spins. And then I topped that off with a rocking horse, and that too was ready to be tested. This time, my friend Maddie helped me with it. So she settled on it, I turned it on, and boy, did Maddie spin! Speaking of which, we're still looking for Maddie, so, um... If any of you happen to see a blonde girl about yay high, please let me know. So all I have to do after that was wait. Finally, the big day rolled around. My brother opened one present. It was an invitation. You're invited to Disneyland in your backyard. So I removed his blindfold. He took in the garbage bags, the wheelbarrow, the monstrosity of the washing machine, and I could tell it just wasn't living up to his promise of a personal theme park. Just wait till you try it, I said. But after he got lost in a maze of black plastic and landed on his head after a roller coaster incident, I could tell he was a little underwhelmed. The merry-go-round was my last chance to make his day. So, when he settled onto it, now with a seatbelt, I turned the washing machine to delicate, because I really didn't want to send another child into orbit. My poor brother spanned faster and faster and faster. The washing machine's lie. It was in no way delicate. He spanned faster and faster and faster until eventually he flew up into the air and landed in a tree. Hang on, I yelled as he clung to a branch. I was so mad at myself. I'd given him the worst birthday ever. He never wanted a theme park in the first place. All he wanted was to ride in a fire truck. Then I called 911. A couple minutes later, I saw a big red fire truck pull up at her house. A fireman stepped out, pulled out a ladder, helped him down, and said, 
Looks like this kid's got roughed up pretty good. We better take him to the, e to the ER just to be safe. Oh, and he can ride with us. My brother stepped into the passenger side of the fire truck, looked at me and said, Best birthday ever! I needed money for my gymnastics meet. It cost $75! Seriously? How did they expect eight-year-olds to cough up 75 bucks? So I set up a lemonade stand. The overhead, lemons and sugar, were already paid for by my parents. So all I had to do was set up the stand and wait for the money to come pouring in. No rent, no business license, no food handler's permit. It was the ultimate get-rich-quick scheme. As I sat there in the sun, knowing it was only a matter of time before thirsty stragglers with padded wallets came begging for my sweet sustenance. I, I realized there was a hole in my plan. How was I going to manage all the money I was going to make? Should I work with an investment banker? Or should I store the money in a tightly secured pool so I could swim through it like Scrooge McDuck? As I was deliberating over this mind-blowing quandary, I realized something even more distressing. Across the street, my art nemesis, Elwa, had also set up a lemonade stand. No doubt that she had been spying on my lucrative operation and trying to steal my share of the market. To make things worse, Ella was using cutthroat business tactics, selling her lemonade at a measly 75 cents per cup. First, I gave her the glare of death. Then I updated my sign. Premium lemonade, squeezed from 100% organic lemons, handpicked in Nicaragua, plus free foot massages. In response, Ella started giving away prizes with each purchase, such as slightly used My Little Pony coloring books and decapitated Barbie dolls. At least she intended to give them away. Neither of us had actually made a sale yet, but that was beside the point. This was about corporate warfare. So I gave away even better prizes. Chinese finger traps, plastic vampire teeth, and Barbies with their heads still on. Though I regret I couldn't find her clothes. By then, it was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and kids were walking home from school. And wouldn't you know it, the cheapskates were more interested in saving a quarter than superior products and free foot massages. As Ella glared at me with satisfaction, I did what I had to. I got out my Sharpie and updated my sign to, Free puppies with each purchase! This finally succeeded in turning the crowds my way, and the sales started rolling in. Of course, I didn't have actual puppies to give away, but I'm pretty sure you can buy them on Amazon. So I took my customers' names and addresses and promised them free two-day shipping. The best part was, since my dad set up a one-click checkout, I wouldn't have to pay for a thing. Meanwhile, a desperate Ella tried to steal away my customers by bringing in a live band. The band was an overstatement. It was really just some hipster college student with a guitar. Regardless, things were getting serious, and I needed a solution now. So I got on my dad's laptop and updated his account from 2D sipping to instant delivery. Then I ordered a 16-foot stage, two monster sacks of speakers, and Mariah Carey. You'd think that would settle the competition. But apparently Ella's family also had Amazon Triple Prime. Because she brought in a cotton candy machine, an elephant, and the Wrangling Brothers. So I brought in the U.S. Navy Brass Band, the Dallas Cowboy Cheerleaders, and Channel 5 News. In response, Ella brought in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. So I brought in an air show featuring F-16 sets. I was about to order some Lamborghinis as giveaways when my dad came home and said it was time for me to clean up and that my friends had to go home. He was kind of upset when he heard about all the things I'd bought. I just reminded him it was all for my gymnastics meet, part of my physical educa education. And you can't put a price on education. True, I'd racked up $50 million in debt, but it was money well spent because it taught me this valuable lesson. As the great Homer Simpson put it, if at first you don't succeed, it's probably not worth trying for. Thank you.
Thank you, Aspen. <clears throat> Aspen first performed at the Timpanoga Storytelling Festival at age three, and she's been telling stories ever since. If you want to check out some of her killer YouTube videos, just look her up on YouTube. She sings Fight Song, and she does a pretty good cover. And some of these stories are also on YouTube as well, as well as Percy's uh, story. Uh, next up, we have Araya Gashler. Now, Araya is actually Hebrew for lion. This is because we discovered Araya during a expedition in an African safari in Zimbabwe. She had been raised by lions, and though we adopted her as her own, unfortunately, we haven't been able to get rid of some of her more ferocious tendencies, as you will soon see. Araya Gashler will be telling two stories, one of them including a, a former winner from the Liars Contest. Take it away, Araya. When I was six years old, I thought cheetahs were the fastest animals. But my four-year-old sister was right. It's actually peregrine falcons, which wouldn't be a big deal if we hadn't wagered $100,000. Five years later, she was still reminding me of my debt. With honor at stake, I had to get a job. So I invested my meager savings into a snow cone stand. First, I tried selling to neighborhood kids. Then I learned the ugly truth. The income of the average kid is well below the poverty line. Lesson learned, sell to adults. Next I chose the, in next I chose the biggest office complex in town, but so did every last food truck. Though I don't know why anyone would prefer Mongolian barbecue over hand-shaved ice with genuine red dye and 100% pure corn syrup. Lesson learned, avoid competition. Next, I chose the industrial side of town, but it seemed that fate was against me because as soon as I set up my stand, it started to snow, and nobody wants a snow cone in actual snow. Lesson learned, choose your environment wisely. With my very last dollar, I traveled to the hottest place I could think of, where there would be no kids and no competition. The middle of a desert. Mine was the only business in sight. In fact, it was the only human habitation in sight. While business was slow, I figured that as soon as a customer came my way, I could sell them a snow cone for a, ridiculous, for a ridiculously jacked up price. If, for example, I charged $100,000, I would only need to make one sale. But hours and days went by and still no sign of business. The heat was starting to do me in. Fortunately, I had a snow cone stand. Unfortunately, I ate so many snow cones that I only had enough ingredients to make one more. At first, I thought it was another mirage, but as it got closer, there was no mistaking the sight of Arabian nomads on camels. The leader dismounted and approached me, one hand on his cutlass, the other stroking his beard. He asked, How much for a snow cone? I had been preparing for this moment. $100,000. Ha ha ha, funny girl. Now tell me, what is the real price? I already told you. I could see the way he was eyeing my tiger blood syrup. I'll give you one silver coin. You know very well that a snow cone out here is worth its weight in gold. Fine, one gold coin. I only have one snow cone left. I'm not about to give it away for a measly lump of gold. He stepped uncomfortably close. Okay, I make you another deal. You give me the snow cone and I give you your life. You are a terrible haggler. I already have my life. He unsheathed his cutlass and pointed it at me. Does this change your mind? A bent scrap of metal? What do you take me for? He nodded to his men, and all of them unsheathed their cutlasses. I don't care if you give me every scrap of metal in the Sahara Desert. No dough, no snow. He just stared at me for a moment. Then he lunged at my cooler, trying to pry it open. I jumped on it and slapped him in the face. Stunned, he stepped backward. Then he turned to his men, and they huddled in a group. I could hear them making angry exchanges in a foreign language. When the leader came back, he was leading a camel. He pulled off a tarp, revealing chests, overflowing with gold and silver. 
Give me the snow cone, and this is all yours. What, what good is all that out here? I'd rather keep my snow cone. He pounded his fist onto my table, and I confess that I may have jump up, jumped a bit. What do you want? He demanded. I count six camels loaded with treasure. Throw in two more, and the snow cone is yours. He didn't hesitate to shake my hand. Deal. I served him up with the rest of the melting snow and slathered it with syrup. He downed the whole thing in three bites. Wiping his mouth, he said, that was the best trade I've ever made. You are telling me. In the end, with my newfound friends and a camel caravan, I didn't die of heat stroke. When I showed this treasure to my sister, I told her, I bet a million dollars you won't believe where I got this. Unfortunately, she did believe me. One day, my mom bought a statue from the home and garden store. She thought it would be a nice addition to our house. The only problem was, our house was so cluttered, we had to keep the statue in my room. And it's not that I hold anything short of reverence for the father of our nation, George Washington. It's just that something about those stony eyes staring at me all night. I may or may not have taken a hammer to it. What was my surprise when the stone crumbled away, revealing the secret within? The reason it looked so lifelike was because it was sculpted around the real George Washington, who was staring right back at me. How are you still alive? I asked. My constituents wanted to preserve me for a future time when I would be needed again, he said. So they dipped me in carbonite. Oh. I think that happened to Han Solo, too. Tell me, what is the national crisis that calls for my generalship? Have the British returned? No. Are we at war with France? No. Surely there must be some dire reason to awake me from centuries of slumber. I'm sorry, it was an accident. Was she like a Twinkie? What's it made of? I didn't know, so I read the ingredients on the box. Enriched wheat flour, sugar, corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, partially hydrogenated soybean oil, sodium acid pyrophosphate. George barred his wooden teeth. Americans eat this garbage? All the time. What have we become, a nation of sugar addicts? I didn't know how to answer that, so we asked Google and learned that two-thirds of Americans are overweight, one-third are obese. Diet-induced maladies, including heart disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, are at all-time highs. I see why I've returned, George said. I must lead the war against bad eating habits. Are you with me? I was. The war was really fun. First, we went to the music store and bought a snare drum and bell. I, rang the, I played the drums while George rang the bell, shouting, Eat your vegetables! We handed out flyers listing the harmful ingredients in junk food, though not many people were interested. As George became more determined, we picked up some carrots and cucumbers from the grocery store and stuffed them into people's mailboxes. Some people got mad, so we had to run from house to house. But the most exciting part was when we snuck into the hostess factory and stuff and replaced all of the cream filling with asparagus bits. That's when things got ugly. A police officer saw us running from the scene because neither of us knew how to drive a car, and we were put in jail. Still, George kept his head high. All, in, all night long, he told me stories of fighting at Valley Forge and crossing the Delaware. He was proud of me for serving my country, and I felt really good. The next day, we were put in front of a judge, he didn't know what to do because I was a minor and George was George Washington. So he decided to let us off the hook if George renounced his terrorist allegiances by eating a Twinkie. Don't do it, George, I cried. George fought an inner battle, but in the end he took a bite of the Twinkie, saying, A Twinkie is a sometimes food. After all that adventure... We decided America wasn't ready for the return of George Washington, so we went to a carbonite specialist who preserved the father of our nation for another 200 years. But before George sank into the lone steamy pit, he 
He looked up at me and said, Remember to keep alive that celestial fire inside of you called conscience. Okay, I said. Shortly thereafter, my mom returned him to the home and garden store. It was hard to say goodbye. Some might call our war a failure, but as for this American, before I indulge in high fructose corn syrup and partially hydrogenated soybean oil, I think of George and listen to my conscience because I really don't want to end up with wooden teeth. Thank you, Araya. And good job, our interpreter, Dale. I don't know how he translated carbonite and sodium acid pyrophosphate into ASL. These people are amazing. All right. Um, unfortunately, I am your last entertainer, so you're stuck with me for the rest of the hour. And I have a few liar stories as well that I'm going to share with you. So <clears throat> this is a new one. Um, it's actually an old one. It happened back in high school. You see, it was the Valentine's dance, and I had been asked by my secret crush to the girl's choice dance by this girl named Lily. Now, Lily was something else. She dyed her own hair, she sewed her own clothes, and I'm pretty sure she subsisted on a diet made out of entirely seaweed and soy milk. She spent her afternoon hours picking up litter and taking care of stray dogs. In fact, one time in class, I remember that our teacher interrupted his lecture when he noticed that Lily was turning blue. After a deep inhalation, she explained that she was trying to reduce carbon emissions. I don't know why Lily asked me of all people to the dance, but whatever the reason, I was not going to botch it. Last I heard, I thought she was dating this, this meathead named, uh, what was it, Chad? Yeah, but this was my chance. So I went to the local store where I was going to buy a suit because this was a formal dance. And when I shopped around, I saw this amazing deal on wool suits. Then I remembered, however, that according to Lily, wool was created through animal exploitation. And all the other suits had polyester in them, which according to Lily was poisoning the oceans. Soon it was the day before the dance, and I had no idea what I was going to wear. Then it hit me. I should be like Lily and make my own clothes. I thought she would be especially impressed if I were to make a suit entirely out of recycled materials. Only problem was I didn't know how to... The only recycled materials I could think of to work with was newspaper. Though the more I thought about it, the more panache I saw in a newspaper suit. I would be the talk of the entire dance. So, I raided the local newspaper bin and started paper macheing some pants. Then I remembered that Lily had this thing against refined starches, so instead of holding it together with flour, I held it together with mud. It was more earthy that way. After I had created a coat, I reinforced it with a chain mail made out of soda can tabs and added a layer of moss. You know, for style. I had to leave it outside to dry because my parents wouldn't let it in the house, but the next morning, it fit like a glove. Better than a glove, actually, because I couldn't take it off. For my hair, I used the most eco-friendly stiffening agent, also mud, and topped it all off with a hat made out of a bird's nest. I had never felt closer to nature. So you could understand my confusion when Lily showed up at my door and had a look of horror on her face. I soon put two and two together, however, and realized that, of course, she was feeling guilty as her less than panache dress showed clear signs of polyester. It's okay. I mean, nobody's perfect. Speaking of which, there was no way her car emitted less than 4.6 metric tons of carbon dioxide per year, but I wasn't judging her. I just took a seat in the passenger side of the car, which was hard to do without cracking my pants and spilling dirt everywhere. I just pretended nothing had happened. Then we parked near the restaurant, and we had a ways to walk. Now this proved to be a formidable challenge amid my stiff enclosure. I must have looked like a walking tree which would explain why a dog urinated on my leg. Again, I just pretended nothing had happened. Once in the restaurant, Lily and I both ordered salads. It was this nice place for vegan hipsters called Sludge, I think. Anyway, I was enraptured by the sound of her voice. I just watched her as she talked about her initiatives to save the monkeys in Asia, though it was hard to concentrate because I had this uncomfortable feeling that little things were crawling in my body, you know? 
That was when I realized I had an ant infestation. Ants were crawling up my neck and out of my collar onto the table. I would have just ignored them had not Lily noticed them and screamed. What? I said. Oh my goodness! What kind of establishment is this? When the waiter came, I complained about the ants, and we were moved to another table. Of course, that didn't solve the problem of the ants, though I was able to conveniently cover them up with some well-placed napkins for a while. Eventually, to destroy the unruly evidence, I had to eat the ants. Then I felt guilty, however, so I coughed them back up. <coughs> Lily asked, Are you okay? You know, I think I'm ready to go to the dance. Poor Lily must have thought I was sick, which would explain why she kept her distance from me at the dance. That, or maybe she wasn't used to all the attention. You see, true to my prediction, no one could keep their eyes off me. I felt it was my duty to entertain them, so I performed the robot, a stiff 1950s robot. During the slow dance, either Lily felt duty-bound to dance with me, or she could no longer resist my charm. I'll let you decide which. As she got closer, she started sniffing, and she said, What's that smell? Pine sap, I said. A all-natural cologne. Then I took her hand. I reached around her shoulder blade and pulled her in close. That was when a squirrel scurried out of my collar and jumped into her hair. Screaming, she stumbled out of the way out of the way as the squirrel clawed her, hanging on for dear life. Then together they crashed into the refreshments table, knocking over the punch bowl and sending eclairs everywhere. As every head turned in my direction, I shouted, All right, who brought the squirrel? Thankfully, Lily laughed the whole thing away. She even licked some cream off her face as she tried to get up to her feet. Then I realized that I was not being a gentleman. Wait! I shouted, running toward her. She reached out a hand to me, which I had to push out of the way in order to point at her face. That cream is not vegan! After a silence that befell the entire room, it so happened that Lily's ex-boyfriend, Chad, helped her up to her feet and said, Some of us are going to go to the steakhouse to pick up some grub. You want to ditch this weirdo and come? I'm yours, said Lily, and they walked away together. I don't know what her problem was, but I decided it was for the best because, after all, dancing creates unnecessary carbon emissions. So, by myself on the dance floor, while Tim McGraw sang My Best Friend, I just stood there as a human tree and hugged myself. This other time, we were low on milk, and it was my turn to go shopping. Now, I don't know where my wife got this crazy idea that I'm some sort of reckless spender, though it was a time in our marriage when we didn't have a lot of money, so for whatever reason, she made me promise to only carry what I was able to only buy what I was able to carry out of the store. So I went to the grocery store, I walked straight to the dairy section, picked up a gallon of milk, and returned to the cashier. True, I was tempted by the Pop-Tarts, but come on, I had willpower. The cashier asked if I wanted to donate $5 to help the monkeys in Asia. I did not want to help the monkeys in Asia. She asked if I would help reduce waste and save the planet by choosing not to put my milk in a bag. Truthfully, I was feeling guilty about the monkeys, so I said yes. And that was that. I was on my way out of the store, however, when I noticed that Cap'n Crunch and M&M's were buy one, get one free. And I thought, what good is milk without Captain Crunch? And you can't just have a bowl of Captain Crunch without M&M's. In the long run, these amazing deals would save us money. I would be stupid not to buy. And then I remembered that our dishes were dirty, which would make eating the Captain Crunch exceedingly difficult. True, I could wash the dishes, however, that would require time. And if time is money, then I would be saving money by buying 72 styrofoam bowls and 50 plastic spoons. Now, by this time, my arms were quite full. But it wasn't a problem because I was done spending. I just walked back to the cashier. Again, I told her I did not want to help the monkeys in Asia, which made me feel bad. So again, I chose not to put anything in a bag, which was okay. I'd made it this far. Surely I could make it to the car. And I would have gone to the car 
had not the manager announced over the PA that all baked goods were 50% off. Now, I know you, like my wife, are thinking I have some sort of spending problem. But if I didn't buy the bagels, they would go to waste. And how could I, in good conscience, try to save the planet by choosing not to put my milk in a bag while simultaneously turning a blind eye to the squandering of precious resources in the form of bagels? So I picked up a few dozen. Of course, I still felt really bad about those monkeys, so I choose not to put any of them in bags. And of course, everybody knows that bagels are entirely useless without cream cheese. Now, carrying a gallon of milk, two boxes of Cap'n Crunch, two bags of M&M, 72 styrofoam bowls, 50 plastic spoons, 36 bagels, and 20 pounds of cream cheese proved to be a formidable challenge. Luckily, the grocery store offered these electric carts reserved for the mobily challenge and the elderly, and I thought, as long as I'm holding everything on my lap, technically I'll only be getting what I'm able to carry out of the store. So I got in the cart and drove around looking for more deals. And it must have been my lucky day, because Pop-Tarts were 20 for the price of 19. So, the only problem was, the mobily challenged elderly lady in the other electric cart also had her eye on the Pop-Tarts. I ran, t or I drove towards them, and together we raced each other to load up on as many boxes as we could. I grabbed my 20th box, fair and square. So you could imagine my surprise when she snatched it out of my hands and drove off. Believe me when I say I had every intention of respecting the elderly, but if I didn't get 20, I wouldn't get the deal. So I chased her, cruising at a whopping five miles per hour. The chase went down the junk food aisle, around the corner, and into the, the produce section, which I normally avoided on principle. As I gained on her, she leaned back and threw a can of chili at me, but I swerved out of the way. Holding onto the accelerator, I reached forward with the other hand and tried to retrieve my stolen Pop-Tarts when she pulled a hard left and I smashed into the bread aisle. Now normally, a cart traveling at five miles per hour would not be sufficient to knock over an entire aisle. However, I remind you that force equals mass times acceleration. And with a gallon of milk, Two boxes of Cap'n Crunch, two bags of M&M, 72 styrofoam bowls, 50 plastic spoons, 36 bagels, 20 pounds of cream cheese, and 19 boxes of Pop-Tarts. I had mass. The bread aisle fell down and landed on the baby food aisle. The baby food aisle knocked down the bread aisle, and like Domino's, the entire store went down. True, this was going to cost me. However, when you considered all the money I was saving, it was like the store was paying me. Meanwhile, the elderly lady was getting away to the checkout stand. I knew at five miles per hour, I'd never be able to get my stolen Pop-Tarts back. So I did what I had to. I grabbed a two-liter bottle of Coca-Cola, unscrewed the lid, and packed it full of Pop-Tart, Pop-Rocks, Alka-Seltzers, and an entire package of Mentos. Then, with my makeshift jet engine beneath my arm, I held on as the cart lurched into motion, accelerated, and rose above the floor. I looked down as I passed over the checkout stand. Then I looked forward as I crashed through the front windows, flew over the parking lot, and landed in a dumpster. But at least I only got what I was able to carry out of the store, except for the gallon of milk which exploded upon impact. But then, who wanted milk anyway? All right, well that concludes our storytelling segment. We have a little more time here, and I think we're going to open it up for questions. So I'm going to invite my crew to come on back up if you'd like, and let, let us uh, look at the questions that are available. All right, it looks like the first one is for me. It is, did Steven star as Wesley in The Princess Bride? Yes. Yes, I did. Okay, and the next question is for Percy. Uh, Percy's story was very violent. Aren't you worried? Bad examples for kids? Percy, do you have anything to say about that? Are you... Are, wait, say, say, say... What was that? Violence is okay if you're cute. Violence is okay as long as you're cute. Okay, well said, Sir Percival. Uh, next question. So, Araya lives in Utah. Are there really Arabian nomads in the deserts there, Araya? Obviously, you need to get out more. <laughs> yeah, for reals. I mean, who hasn't noticed the Arabian nomads in the desert? 
Okay, uh, the next question is for Aspen. It says, I found a blonde girl about four feet, two inches, lodged in my tree. What should I do? Well, actually, Maddie's four foot three inches, so <laughs> it couldn't be hurt. So just leave the girl there. Leave the girl. It's not Maddie. Don't worry about it. Okay, well said. Okay, um, oh, we got another question here. What's the secret to your family's su success as performers? Um, unfortunately, that's a, pro a proprietary secret, so if I told you, I'd have to kill you. However, what I can tell you is that it has something to do with spinach and lots of sriracha sauce. Um, looks like we got another question. Where do you find your stories? Would anyone else like to answer that? Uh, Aspen? Here. It, oh, yeah, we, we usually find them in Aspen's head. Yeah. Ever since she had that lobotomy, we've just been able to, there's actually a hinge back here. We just kind of open it up sometimes and find them in there. They're actually a little bit gross yes. and unfiltered sometimes, so it does take some, some workshopping for sure. A more serious answer. Um, our, our uh, idea generation usually goes like this. Uh-oh, the, uh, the contest is happening in a week. Time to make up a story. So let's have some random ideas. And I'll throw out a random idea. And I'll say something like uh, selling snow cones. And then I'll say to Araya, Araya, say something completely opposite to snow cones. And what would you say? She'll say uh, Bedouins, Arabian nomads, or, or the desert. So we combine those two ideas, and we're like, okay, comedy is an opposite, so selling snow cones in the wackiest place on earth. There you have Good formula for an interesting story. Um, how does the family prepare together? Well, um, as I mentioned, that we have kind of brainstorming sessions together. Um, I then typically take the ideas that we've sort of generated and try to outline them into more of a story. And uh, then uh, sometimes I, I record myself, uh, especially when they were younger and they needed help memorizing and it was just an easy way for them to learn it, especially when they didn't know how to read yet, though they all read now. And uh, that would help them just learn all the words. Um, but then we'd always bounce it off them and they would add their own personalities to it and uh, we would workshop it with friends and families and it's just what we do. How do you work with four to five-year-olds in storytelling? Well, I'll say it. go ahead, Aspen. Mainly you have to bribe them. You have to bribe them? <laughs> did we ever bribe you as a four-year-old? Nope. Oh, we sure did, Aspen. We bribed you with all <laughs> sorts of things, usually in the form of calories, I think, but probably also in tangible things like toys. <clears throat> uh, yeah, it's not easy. Um, how often do you practice? Well, usually when we get the invitation to do these things, we hold off writing our stories till two months. <laughs> and in the final month, we're freaking out. <laughs> so finally we start brainstorming. And, um, and then, like, and then they keep bugging us about it and they make us, like, practice well, after we know our stories, we record them, and then we wait another two weeks. And then after that, we're in, like, mode last-minute panic, and we <laughs> practice every day after that. So, um, Thank you for flaunting our, our dirty laundry, Aspen. Go ahead, Araya. Well, the thing is, like, we, we learn the stories. We practice about every other day until the final week. Then we practice every, twice a day. So, yeah. We're doing better at not putting it off. We, yeah, we don't always procrastinate. <laughs> uh, yeah, next one. Uh, what other types of stories do you love? Who wants to answer that one? Um, it depends who you're asking in this family. Well, she's asking any of us. Oh. Uh, American history stories. Mm. Araya is a war buff. She loves to read about war history. That's correct. You should see her at our house. Percy, what kind of stories do you like? Uh, no, none. He doesn't like stories. <laughs> we dragged him into this against his will. Is that the case? Okay. 
As I said, it's um, bribery. We also love ghost stories. Um, that's something that didn't really come natural to us a few years ago, but then we got involved in the Timpanogos Hauntings Contest and won it a few times, and we just had a lot of fun being spooky and creepy and kind of evil, as well as funny and silly. <laughs> Uh, besides your parents, who inspires you to tell and why? Okay, I think you guys got to answer that one. Um, Maybe who uh -huh. are some of your favorite uh, storytellers that you've seen perform? Sam Payne. Sam Payne. Bill Lepp. Bill Lepp. Percy, do you have one? No. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say Donald Davis, um, Bill Harley, um, all the good ones. Oh, here comes another one. Um, how did ghost stories become comfortable? How did ghost stories become comfortable? Hmm. I'll well, you answer okay, that. I'll answer that one. They want to compete with the ghost stories, but they're all too young, so I'm the only one who's really done it with uh, my wife, Teresa, sometimes. Um, you won first place last year, didn't you? Yeah. How did it become comfortable? Um, I don't know how to answer that. I'm trying to think of a decent answer. I think fundamentally there's really not much of a difference um, because comedy is not actually about being silly. Um, it's really about being stoic. And so really the main difference is simply the story you're telling. It's just the subject matter. Whereas the way you deliver it is really going to be pretty much fundamentally the same. Comedy and drama. A lot of people are surprised when somebody like Jim Carrey, who's known for his comedy, can do really well in a drama. But from his point of view, there's really not much difference, you know? His job is to be deadpan in delivering his lines, and it's the script that's going to make the difference. If it's, like, ironic and over the top, then it's going to be comedy. But if it's, um, you know, uh, if there's foreboding and, and uh, suspense, um, and if it's a serious script, then it's going to be a drama. So. Dad, there's another one. Okay, next one. What makes a strong story? Well, basically, comedy and opposites. <laughs> um, think about two things that are exactly the opposite. Mass it together, make a cool storyline with a plot, and and excite and with characters, an exciting incident, and um, pretty much it. That's pretty much it. That was some excellent dramatic formula, Aspen. Well done. We do talk about that one a lot in our house, that comedy is in opposites. And so often all we're doing is we're trying to be really ironic, you know, trying to juxtapose things that you would never juxtapose in real life. And the unforeseen nature of that causes a diaphragmal spasm and makes you laugh. And so, I mean, that's how we do comedy. But with the uh, Tall Tales in particular, um, the formula also has a lot to do with starting out in the realm of the believable and escalating gradually into the fantastic. So in the beginning, it can't be too subtle, and in the end, it can't be too outrageous. In fact, you, you want to really play up and play down both of those as much as possible. One of the mistakes we've seen a lot that people do when they're making tall tales is they're actually not telling tall tales, they're telling fantasies. Very early on, they'll jump from the believable to the completely unbelievable, and so it, it fails to really capture the disbelief or suspend the disbelief of the audience. So it's all about the subtlety. Do you have something you want to say, Ray? Were you the funny kid at school? Uh, who, who could they be referring to? You. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> Definitely a class clown. I decided very early that being a clown was my calling in life. <laughs> and as far as other types of stories, uh, just at, back in, at, alluding back to the previous question, uh, when it comes to a ghost story, it's very much a similar formula you're doing a crescendo. So you want to start off in the believable, and then instead of ironic and outrageous, you're almost doing the same thing, but you're including suspense. And it's a little more serious and scary. You know, somebody's in a position where they're going to get hurt. There's usually something ambiguous, and you don't know what it is, and that creates suspense. But again, you're following that crescendo pattern from the realm of the normal to however big you can possibly make it. Tell of... Tell of the craziest storytelling performance. Hmm. Um, Anyone want to take that one? Does puppets count? <laughs> we do puppetry. 
We do children and we do animals, all the things you're not supposed to do. Yeah, like two years ago, if it does, um, we were doing puppets for the Timpanoga Storytelling Festival. And so it was all going well. I never realized it, but I was going back, I was backstage working with it. But I heard, heard stories of this boy here running across the street, running across the street, the stage, stage. Um, twirling around. <laughs> yeah. Twirling and dumping around. Yeah, for one of our puppet shows, we, we made Percy when he was only four years old the narrator on purpose because we wanted him to pull things out of nowhere. And he sure did. It was a great improv experience, but we had a lot of fun. I think I, as another answer to that question, <laughs> there's been a number of times we're performing as puppeteers and everything that's gone wrong could go wrong. One time we were doing Pinocchio and not only did the stage fall apart, but Pinocchio's head fell off right before he, he escaped from the whale. <laughs> that was pretty bad. Luckily, the fairy hadn't come yet, so she could set him straight. Uh, another time we were at the Tim Fest and I think our puppet stage collapsed. Um, it's like storytelling. I was actually doing a play. I was playing... Uh, Sir Percival Blakeney and the Scarlet Pimpernel at the Sirius Shell. And if you've been there, this is a huge amphitheater. It could easily fit probably a few thousand people. And I was singing the song about fashion, about, um, you know, uh, the, the, the pants and the cravats of the era and how important it is. And <laughs> during this time, the costumer had never actually fitted my pants. And so I go out there in front of thousands of people and find my pants falling down and I didn't have any belt. And so I had to dance this whole number while holding up my pants. And then I had this huge scene that felt followed and my hand was permanently glued to my side the whole time. It was the worst feeling. I've had the worst luck with pants. It seems like wherever I go, I rip my pants, especially when I'm performing in public. All right. Okay, next question. How do you suggest getting started with storytelling? Um... You just start, and um, you jump into it, and you, um, I really can't think of anything else. My first performance was when I was like three or four. I can't even remember, so um, that's all my advice. Last minute panic. <laughs> yeah, wait until you're like a month before you haven't started with it. No, a week. Yeah, a week, because you have to be in the right mood, and that mood is... Last minute panic. <laughs> okay, we've said a lot about the merits of procrastination. Again, we're, we're trying to move away from that in life. But what I will say on that, though, is the power of a deadline. There are lots of contests, and we love the contests. We think they're fun, you know. And for years, we didn't win anything. And since then, we've won a lot of things. But, you know, you got to just stick with it. And uh, you got to learn from the people who are better than you and figure out what they're doing right, figure out what the winning story always has. And then there's just nothing like a power of a deadline to force you to write and craft and improve and perform. And then you get the feedback of the audience and it's so energizing and it becomes really addicting. So that's what I recommend. Find a contest and be a part of it. All right. What other projects are your family involved in? As I said, we do puppets a lot for the previous two years of Tim Fest. Um, we do the Timpan... We do the contest a lot and that's how we get free tickets most of the time <laughs> we we never buy our tickets uh we have a youtube channel uh yeah, yeah we make videos a lot yeah check out our youtube channel uh we put out a whole bunch of stuff we do music videos and kind of uh fantasy inspired short films um one of our videos had over 12 million views um we are our upcoming one we're going to do this summer is a Mario-inspired adventure. It's going to be one where Bowser becomes the hero and he has to do some parkour skills. Um, a couple years ago, we were all taking gymnastics together. And as part of our recital, we all wanted to show off our parkour and gymnastics skills. And so we made that video that went viral. And so that was a lot of fun. And that kind of launched our, our YouTube career, I guess. Uh, we also put on plays. Uh, we put on a musical about Vikings last year. And we're doing another one this year. It's a Halloween musical. It's called Take My Death Away. And uh, my wife, Teresa, and I wrote it. And we'll probably all play in it because it's a lot of fun. And that's going to be the Angeles Theater and Spanish Fork in October. So we hope you'll join us. Okay, last question. What are your storytelling plans for the future? Um, probably doing more plays and musicals and, I don't know. You gotta get closer to the mic. We just, we 
don't know. We just plan it when <laughs> we hear an event coming up or something. Okay, well, I know. I mean, uh, we love Utah, but we kind of want to move on to other things. So we're, we're hoping to uh, be part of national storytelling festivals and uh, do some touring. I've done a little of that in the past. You know, we've, uh, I've done some touring in California, uh, won an award at the National Storytelling Network in Arizona. Um, but we definitely want to up the game and take it more, more seriously. And uh, we have a lot that we want to do in the realm of musical theater and filmmaking as well, as I mentioned. Okay, so that concludes our questions. And that concludes the story uh, crossroads. Uh, you wore spectacular. Out the interpreter. And we wore out the interpreter. So I want to remind everybody to check out the Tall Tale Handout, which I read it, has a lot of fun information and activities uh, kind of related to this last hour. So check that out. And we want to thank everybody who has worked so hard to put on this amazing festival. For everybody who tuned in and has been watching it, thank you. Again, this has been the Story Crossroads Spectacular.